Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, as always, uh, and uh, talking about uh, just the amazing stuff that's happening here in the UK Biobank. Uh, let's see. All right, great. So um, to start with, um, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about genome-wide association studies and uh, sequencing, and, and we've talked some about phenome-wide association studies as well. That's going to be the focus of my talk. Um, and just to orient us, uh, you know, essentially what we're doing is thinking about an independent variable and exploring um, uh, what phenotypes and the range of phenotypes that are available uh, and associated with that, really anchoring on the fact that we have richly, uh, uh, systematically uh, phenotype sets of individuals such as the UK Biobank and other electronic health record data sets, which is where this uh, started. Usually that's based on things like billing codes, but um, I don't want to limit us there. You can think about laboratory values, you can think about um, natural language processing and things like that as well. Uh, most of it's been based on billing codes. So to start with, I want to orient us to a discovery uh, study for, out of the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, Emerge, um, in the U.S. And uh, it was five sites that worked together for a carefully validated phenotype that we used uh, codes, labs, medications, natural language processing to find these cases and manually va validate uh, who was a case for autoimmune, presumptive autoimmune hypothyroidism. And a control, and we d d identified a thyroid transcription factor um, that was associated and replicated this. Uh, and then we did a, took, took a variant, the same variant that was found here, and did a FIWAS on that variant um, in a uh, slightly larger population, um, uh, you know, that was unselected, or a much larger population, unselected for any given phenotype. And hypothyroidism was the, the, the you know, the highest associated phenotype there. But we also had um, uh, some other thyroid diseases that came up. And um, things like atrial uh, flutter, um, as associated, which um, uh, we know that there's, uh, you know, when you're hypothyroid or less likely to manifest with atrial flutter. And so, so this gives us opportunity to look at the performance of these two uh, methods. And so, you know, on the left we have the um, a schematic of the algorithm we used, and then um, we use these uh, mappings um, I've called FIWAS codes or fee codes. Um, and we usually say there have to be two or more that map into that fee code. And, you know, you can see the odds ratios are essentially the same between the two approaches. Within our population of individuals within eMERGE, you know, we identified more cases um, with the uh, uh, FIWAS codes than we did um, with the algorithm. And so, you know, there's many approaches to FIWAS. And, and just talking about that, you know, I said most use billing codes. In the U.S., that's uh, been historically ICD-9 uh, with the clinical modifications and now ICD-10 after uh, 2015. Um, there's about 65,000 ICD-10 CM codes. Um, and on, on the right, you can see some of the ways this works. So the fee codes have numbers that kind of look like ICD-9 codes, but they're actually not. Um, and, um, and, and then what we do is we group, you know, like codes now across ICD-9 and ICD-10 and ICD-10 CM codes to, you know, a given uh, fee code. And, um, and so all the type 1 codes come together which is not obvious from the IC9 coding group system. Um, and then um, uh, each of those also define ranges of control groups. Um, in addition to the feed code groupings, there are other groupings. In the U.S., there's some, um, the AHRQ has released uh, some software that groups things into about 300 diseases. Um, uh, TreeWAS is another thing. You can also use raw ICD codes, for instance. That gives you a challenge across, of course, mapping between ICD-9 and ICD-10. And um, you can do many other things. Survey data has been run across the U.K. Biobank um, and other things that I've talked about, um, like the procedures. So here's another example, FIWAS, uh, driven by um, uh, EHR data, looking at um, imputed HLA types into the two and four digit types of uh, HLA. Um, and you can see, you know, quickly it highlights the fact that there are different associations between class one and class two uh, HLA alleles and helps you think about the um, range of associations. And, and overall, I, I think there was a hundred or so um, significant associations, um, uh, most of which were known and a few new ones. But what's more interesting is by doing it in a single population, you can actually look across those phenotypes and, uh, and then look for pleiotropy and see, you know, if you adjust and condition on one and the other, uh, do you see, um, uh, you know, that, that, they're, um, uh, that they're truly independent associations. And you can also see, if we get a, a given HLA type, that, you know, one, uh, two HLA types that may put you uh, similarly at risk for rheumatoid arthritis may have differential effect for your risk on type 1 diabetes, for instance. And so, so that is a tool that, you know, you can rapidly explore using this kind of technique. 
Uh, an important aspect is validating its efficacy. And so one of the early things we did um, using our ICD-9 codes uh, uh, across eMERGE was replicating known associations in the GWAS catalog. We found 86 phenotypes that um, uh, were, um, could be represented in the electronic health record um, and um, uh, a number of SNPs, uh, about 750 overall uh, uh, SNP phenotype pairs. Um, overall, we replicated 210 of them across a number of disease classifications and 66% of those for which we were adequately powered in this population of uh, 13,000 people, as well as identifying some novel associations, um, the top of which we replicated. Uh, it also allows us to actually compare the effect size. So here you might, you see something that you would expect to see in that, um, uh, that, that the effect sizes from the FIWAS studies are typically a little bit lower than what's in the GWAS catalog. Now some of that's probably due to the winner's curse, but some of it's also due to the phenotype being not quite as uh, accurate. And it helps you think about the ones that, um, where you have the most error. So the most common error, and it was really um, uh, universally uh, type 1 diabetes is often miscoded. In fact, 96% of the time we found type 1 diabetics had type 2 diagnosis codes. And so, so you know, it, it, it made it, um, uh, it made it, uh, and the reverse is true 56 percent of the time. So, so it, it caused a lot of um, inaccuracy in the type 1 diabetes phenotype, um, and uh, we had trouble replicating some of those SNPs. And we've actually instituted methods to uh, fix that problem, and we can recover those associations. Um, so here's, here's a way you can use FIWAS in concert with a GWAS. So we did a GWAS and eMERGE um, looking at longitudinal risk of heart vascular disease on a statin and found uh, variants um, that, that um, are tied to expression of uh, lipoprotein A were associated with that outcome as a longitudinal analysis. And uh, that risk is increased for those that have, you know, kind of ideal uh, cholesterol levels at less than 70. So we looked at a, a FIWAS of this lo locus. And, you know, as you would expect, you see uh, coronary atherosclerosis uh, near the top. And, um, and fortunately, we see most of the phenotypes are ones we would expect to see, which uh, gets at the question of if you were to target this with a medication, you know, uh, what potential effects would you see? Um, and so one of the things that's interesting, it wouldn't have been on a radar screen, is this point over here, which is not quite statistically significant, was lung cancer. So, um, uh, you know, this is a relatively small population of 13,000 people. As it's explored uh, more, maybe that will turn out to be true or not. Um, uh, but it is a rapid tool for highlighting, especially when you think about the scale of UK Biobank. I mentioned mapping these to ICD-10 and ICD-10-CM codes. Just shows a little bit of the process and the vocabularies and systems that we used uh, in the process with some manual validation. It is in, in what we call and still in beta form. Um, but uh, you can see it covers about 90% of the um, build um, uh, ICD codes in the UK Biobank. And amongst the 10% that aren't there, most of those are not actual disease codes. Uh, only a small fraction of those represent true disease codes. Um, uh, and we did an evaluation at um, uh, using our data with ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes in, in terms of FIWAS, and uh, you can see that the effect sizes um, between this and this population um, was essentially the same for these two um, known associations with that uh, SNP. So um, I want to give a few examples. Actually, Kristen showed this earlier, um, uh, doing a FIWAS in the UK Biobank, um, and just tons of association associated with atrial fibrillation, genetic risk score for AFib. Um, and um, and uh, uh, when they um, condition for uh, the phenotypes, the cardiovascular phenotypes, essentially, uh, those associations went away. Um, and, uh, but it shows the power of a huge population to show lots of things you expect to see. Uh, here's another one for systolic blood pressure on a, um, a, a, a large uh, GWAS that was done across the Million Veteran Program as well as um, uh, the UK Biobank. And um, uh, just a number, number of associations showing up with systolic blood pressure. They also did it with diastolic blood pressure and pulse pressure to show that some of these phenotypes overlap. And you see phenotypes that are not exactly associated with um, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease in here coming out as well, endocrine being um, one of the more common ones. Here's um, uh, a, a resource. Um, Kristen also talked about the SAGE approach to um, use saddle point approximation to uh, create a, a, an efficient and accurate way of um, calculating these kind of results at scale for the UK Biobank. Um, uh, they have produced a website where you can explore um, those phenotypes um, calculated uh, using the same approaches for fee codes um, across the UK Biobank. And this just shows a particular um, AFib SNP um, uh, in that website. Um, and the URL there is there at the bottom. 
So, um, uh, you know, we've talked about this in, 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 in looking at individual phenotypes. And I want to spend the last few minutes talking about um, uh, phenotypes uh, in clusters and how we think of them. So if you think about, you know, Mendelian disease is, is a classic example that are often syndromic presenting with many different features. And those features, you know, are, are what we may bill in the electronic medical record as physicians, but it doesn't necessarily represent, um, uh, you, you know, the, the, the disease is not always recognized or, you know, may be recognized later into the disease course as we, you know, uh, heard about earlier with hemochromatosis. And so um, through the online Mendelian Inheritance in Man uh, resource and the linked hematype, uh, human phenotype ontology, you know, uh, we can go from a Mendelian disease to a list of uh, features of that disease which have a vocabulary behind them. And then uh, so, so our lab um, mapped um, uh, uh, those HPO features to uh, fee codes, so basically allowing you to translate OMIM uh, features um, into uh, EHR phenotypes. And then uh, sim similar to a polygenic risk score, you know, creating a phenotype risk score um, uh, that, that looks uh, similar in process. So aggregating phenotypes up by their weights um, to produce a score for individual. And essentially you can uh, crank this out across anything for which you have a map um, uh, and uh, do it at scale. So let's look at cystic fibrosis, a number of features from OMIM, and uh, each of those is mapped to a human phenotype ontology code. And so um, using our fee code ontology of around 1,800 phenotypes, um, and you can map the ones that um, line up fairly well to the um, CF. They're not all exact matches. Um, uh, some are better matches than others, and then some that we don't have in the EHR, which you know we're familiar with. Um, and so let's play that out on a couple um, individuals, uh, hypothetical different conditions. Um, I mentioned they're weighted, so features like bronchiectasis have a higher weight than features like asthma. Um, and so when you go across this, you know individuals get a different score, and what you find is you can separate cases and controls um, uh, uh, for cystic fibrosis. Um, uh, you know, just using the features of disease. So we're not using the disease label, but in this example, we use um, uh, manually validated um, uh, cases versus controls who um, don't have any evidence of the disease um, uh, in, the, in the text record. And we see a very significant result. And we've actually done this for um, uh, 15 other diseases now. And um, in, in every case, um, uh, except for one, um, we've seen very strong separation between cases and controls. The one exception is phenylketonuria, which, as you know, um, uh, in the US is on uh, essentially every newborn screening test. And if you avoid phenylalanine exposure, you don't actually see you know, the manifestations of the disease. So it sort of gives you a test of the effectiveness of newborn screening in um, uh, removing um, uh, the features of disease in the population um, because they generally do not have elevated scores. So we turned this on a, a population of 21,000 people that had exome array genotyping and looked at 6,000 variants um, uh, that were rare at a 1% level or less. And we found 18 significant associations, most of which were novel. Um, uh, and, and, and importantly, um, uh, we were able to change the um, ACMG uh, clinical interpretations for eight of these variants towards a likely pathogenic or pathogenic. Um, and uh, so, so this using our population is, is a paradigm that I think can be explored with larger uh, rich phenotype populations such as what is in the UK Biobank. So I want to end and, um, with uh, 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 recognition of some of the many people contributing to this work, um, and the middle row is probably the most important row as, as the folks actually doing the work. Thank you very much.